Welcome to another Fibre Laser Learning Lab. I might look as I'm relaxing. This thing up here is going bonkers. I'm having all sorts of problems trying to understand something, a major feature of this machine. I spoke about it in I think it was the last session. It's a danger called back reflection, which I'm told can cause very serious damage to this machine. I've been warned that you, first of all, you need to be very, very careful about where you set the focus on shiny materials. Shiny is a bit of a misnomer because it's not a shiny surface that you're worried about. It's a reflective surface and they're not necessarily exactly the same thing. A reflective surface will be something like gold or silver. Yeah looks as I've got lots of that I'm going to play with on the machine here, doesn't it? Or something that I have got, which is almost the same level of reflection, is copper. Now, shiny stainless steel, you would think, is reflective. It's not quite as reflective as you think. And it's all down to the crystal structure or the atomic structure of the material itself. But we'll come on to that a little bit later. The biggest problem I've got is trying to understand just how the actual rays, I call them rays because that's what other people call them, beam, how the beam can reflect back on itself. I don't imagine the beam as being a beam. I imagine the beam as being like a herd of sheep. It's an entity of photons. Each photon is a separate item. But I'm not a physicist and I think that's really the wrong concept and may well be a confusing concept. I'm yet to try and find that out. I suppose you could regard it almost like a tsunami, as I've mentioned that word before. A tsunami, a tsunami is a wave, a, a huge wave of energy. And I suppose photons, when they all act together, are just like that, a big wave of energy. But every one of those photons is a separate entity inside that wave. So. It is both at the same time a collection of bits and pieces, elements, the photons, and the entity, which is the wave. And it is the wave that maybe does the damage, although the wave is a collection of photons. Very confusing. I'm trying to get that picture in my mind when I should imagine one thing or when I should imagine something else. The other thing that I've been told, and I, have, I don't disbelieve this at all because it's from a very an eminent physicist, is that photons, when they act together in total parallelism, if they get out of synchronism, they will cancel each other out and you'll get nothing. But when they collide with each other, unlike two streams of water, for example, which when you hit them together just go pfft, photons just don't care about each other. They can exist in the same space and can pass each other. So from that point of view, I can understand what back reflection is. If you get a photon reflect off the surface, it will not cancel out by an oncoming photon, even though it collides with it. Well, that's what I've been led to believe. So I've got all these confusing concepts in my brain at the moment, which I can't really put together and make sense of when it, people talk about the dangers and the damage of back reflection from this machine. So. Today we're going to do a little bit of a, an analysis from a practical point of view of trying to find out what's going on. So we're going to do some rather strange things today which I very much doubt whether many people have done before but this is not a NASA laboratory. I don't have any sophisticated equipment therefore I have to be very inventive with the very basic pieces of kit that I've got. But quite often you can get very good, not accurate, but good answers from basic equipment. Now, what I've got on the work table here is a piece of wood, which we know will not be affected by the beam in any way, shape or form. And I've set the beam to go backwards and forwards this way. So I know roughly where the beam is as it comes out of the lens. It's not going to change very much its position at all, because remember, down here, it's a long way away from the lens. That means when it comes out of the lens, there's going to be virtually no movement on that beam at all. When the beam hits this thermocouple, there will be a heating effect. So as the beam scans backwards and forwards, if it manages to hit the thermocouple, it should raise the temperature. 
and that tells me where the edge of the beam is. And then I can approximately work out what the diameter of the beam is when it comes out of the lens, which is quite an important fact for me, because I want to work out what the angle of the cone is that gets me down to the focal point. I'm just on the edge of the red beam there. I'm gonna pull it back just a shade. There we go, we're working now. Wow, look, we've got some results. So we know where the beam is. So we've hit the edge of the beam there somewhere. Let's just see, let's draw it back a little bit further. Run the test again. No effect. So let's just edge it forward just a shade again. And there we go. So we found the edge of the beam. I've got a black mark on there. Sorry, this is not a continuous beam passing over that thermocouple. It's just very quickly scanning over it, leaving a little bit of energy behind. Getting towards the middle of the beam now, so let's just see, see if we can find the highest power. 180. 264. Certainly there, somewhere, is approximately the centre. So let me mark very carefully that as well. Okay, so there's my two marks on there, and I would say they're about two millimetres apart. So that represents the centre to one half of the beam, which would indicate that the beam is probably around about four millimetres diameter. But of course, that isn't entirely true, because remember, it is a Gaussian distribution, and probably I'm not picking up the tails of the beam. I'm only picking up the most powerful part of the beam, that's enough to heat the thermocouple. So it's very likely that the beam might actually be as wide as they claim, which is a seven millimeter beam. And I'm only picking up maybe four millimeters or maybe four and a half millimeters of that beam. These are two zinc selenide lenses off of a CO2 machine. They're fairly short focal length and uh, I knew what I was doing when I tried to engrave stain the steel with them. Now, as I said, I knew what I was doing and I knew there was a risk of reflection. And here's a good example of exactly what happens. These lenses are only some 40 millimetres above the surface of the material. The one on the right, look, has heated up the front face of the lens and it's actually cracked right the way through the lens itself. And the one on the left, I've managed to burn the anti-reflective coating off the face of the lens. That optics can be damaged by reflections, I have no doubt. How I can manage to achieve it with a lens system which is 254 millimetres above the work surface, I'm struggling with. Now I often make it clear, I'm not a teacher. I'm on a learning journey. I've got a lot of elemental facts about how laces work and how materials operate. But sometimes it's a bit like having a jigsaw puzzle when you first open the box. All the pieces are there, but they don't actually make any sense. And that's the problem I find quite often. So one of the techniques that I use to try and help organize my thoughts is to write a document and put things down in a logical order. And that's what I'm attempting to do here. I've got a series of titles here, subject titles, which I'm going to go through. Now I'm not gonna apologize that some of these I've already discussed with you before. But we're going to discuss them again because they form part of this logical chain of working towards an answer. Now at the moment, I'm giggling to myself here because I don't have an answer. I've still got the same confusion that I had uh, when, I, when I made the first part of the video. But I'm fairly confident that by the time we work our way through this list, we will arrive at a sensible answer. I shall probably have to do some research in the meantime, but this is taking several days to create this video. This is not quite the live video that I normally do. So let's push on and make a start. Now my early sessions of this series explained how uh, an excited electron 
manages to be disturbed by a passing photon and it drops down to a lower energy level and in dropping down to a lower energy it emits something called a photon of light. It's got no mass but it somehow has energy and as it goes past excited electrons it drags them all down and they just like this picture here they all remain phase synchronized doesn't mean to say they're all together but they remain basically locked together in the same sort of phase now this is a problem that i'm having trying to decide when these little minute entities turn into something else but when they turn into something else they become more powerful you can pause the video and read what it says I come across this this concept that a, a beam of these photons is a collective term um, and even though the photons remain individual little packets of energy um, just like sheep in a herd they can never be one big sheep they are just a herd it can be persuaded as an entity to move in different directions for example a sheep dog herding the sheep will move the sheep regard the sheepdog if you like as an external influence um, but it's affecting the whole of the the wave it's not just affecting one sheep when they're all traveling in the same direction as a laser beam they technically should all be in phase but if for some reason they get out of phase then they will cancel and there will be no energy no light but we'll, we'll come back to this little subject here in a minute this is this is what I have read so far my, my two gray cells are very easily confused when waves collide they will add or subtract but when photons collide they just pass through each other I'm glad I'm not a physicist <laughs> now a photon is a little packet of energy which is a fixed packet of energy it has a certain if you want to imagine it as a wave it has a certain amplitude or a volume you can't change that so if you want more light intensity or light density you need to pack more photons into the same physical area or volume so therefore I suppose if we imagine a single photon as being like a raindrop it will have very little damage potential but if you put millions and billions and gazillions of them together and move them in unison that now becomes a wave imagine a tsunami look at the potential damage you can do with a tsunami wave the beam on this 20 watt fiber laser machine is basically no different than the format of the beam on the CO2 gas discharge laser. And what I'm saying here is the density of the photons is maximum right at this point here, right down the center. Okay, this is the highest point on the graph. This is the greatest light intensity and the greatest light intensity means we've got maximum density of photons. Okay, now this is a seven millimeter diameter beam so very crudely let's just say that it's six millimeters diameter because that makes it nice and easy to look at what we've got here then we've got one two three four five six sections so the center two millimeters of that beam if it's a 20 watt beam contains 13.6 watts there's no such thing as a section of the beam these are just convenient breakpoints to show you approximately what's happening within the beam the next section out which is another millimeter on either side of the center we've got only 2.7 watts and right on the outside we've got half of nothing so really the only moderately powerful part of the beam is the central two millimeters even though it's a seven millimeter diameter beam and that's a very important point to remember now 100% power is not 20 watts 20 watts is down here if we chop the graph off across that 20 watt line and we should be able to take the top half of that graph and we'll be able to fill in the gaps at the bottom here okay so that's roughly what that 31% is that 31% of 100% power is where our 20 watt average power is and if we like to consider then that 100% power is probably 65 watts right at the peak so we've got 20 watts average power but probably 65 watts available to us at the peak now I'll leave that part on the screen just in case you want to read it but I've just described what that says now 
In this section, we're not actually going to talk about how the lens focuses. That's a completely separate section that I'm going to come on to next. What we want to do is look at how the light gets affected as it passes through the lens. Now, this was another big problem that I was having, trying to understand the concept of, first of all, what happens when the light hits the lens. Now, I, I know enough about physics to know that when a ray of light hits a surface, it gets refracted. Now, refracted means change direction, or does it? It also means that it changes speed, the light within the glass or that medium reduces its speed. It slows down. How can light slow down? Now, although this is not pure glass, it's a glassy type material and the light will slow down inside the glass to about 200 million meters a second. Yeah, OK, that's not really slowing down, is it? But it's it has reduced by about a third. This ray of light here enters at 300 million and travels that distance. This ray of light here enters at 300 million and travels that distance. Now, as it goes in and slows down, this ray here must exit before this ray here. OK, so there are no possibly no longer a laser beam because they must be out of phase. Reading between the lines, I've been advised by a very learned physics professor that I'm basically an idiot. I didn't need to be told because I know that already. As I said, I'm an engineer, not a physicist, and I don't know how a physicist's mind works. Certainly this stuff is almost like reading Chinglish. But what I am and can understand is that although this ray here exits before this ray here, it has further to travel to get to the focal point. So although it resumes its journey sooner, it will get there later because it's got further to travel. And although this one exits later, it will get there sooner because it's got a shorter distance to travel. And the idiot part of it was it wouldn't be a lens if they didn't all arrive at the same time. That's the whole point of a lens. OK, so I didn't know that. <laughs> so I've just described what that text says, but I'll leave it on the screen so you can pause and read it if you wish. OK, now we come on to something rather interesting, which gets us into a very controversial area, because this is not an area where I can find any information. The only information that I've got is information that I've developed for myself. This is lens theory. And everybody seems to rely on lens theory and not what happens in practice. And I have had to investigate what happens in practice because I could not make lens theory agree with what I was observing. You cannot focus light to a point any smaller than its wavelength. So the smallest possible spot we could get for this fiber laser is roughly one micron. Now the problem is it would be incredibly expensive to make a lens which physically focused down to the theoretical minimum one micron. And in reality, all lenses have got something called aberration which means that they do not pass through this theoretical focus point. You will see the path of light described through a lens in the way that I've shown it on this diagram here. That's totally ludicrous because light cannot bend around corners. So how does this diagram come about? If we take a look at this um, plano convex lens that I've drawn here, you'll see that the rays from the outside of the lens are crossing over at a focal point which is less than where the arrow shows D. And those rays that are coming down the centre of the lens are crossing over substantially beyond D. 
and the profile that you see in the picture above has been sketched in there to show you that basically what you've got it's that outline which encapsulates all the beams that are going towards the focal point focal point is a bit of a misnomer I like to call that DR a fuzzy focal point because the closer the beams are to the axis of the lens the further they cross over beyond the actual focal point and very conveniently this diagram which I've picked up happens to be approximately three divisions on either side of centerline now if you want to go back to the beginning and take a look at the distribution of light energy in that beam hitting the lens remember we've got roughly 70 percent of the light energy within those two central rays so therefore that maximum intensity of light down the center of the beam is actually focusing quite a long way beyond the nominal focal point so this is a very confusing practical situation we've got a very reputable company here 26 who make all sorts of optical systems very very high uh, laboratory and industrial lenses two very important points we must note spherical aberration increases the spot size now let's just turn that on its head for a moment and say if the spot size was theoretically perfect for this machine and with this lens we would have a one micron spot size we do not have a one micron spot size on this machine we've got a 254 millimeter long focal length lens which has got a claimed spot size of about 65 microns that's a lot more than the theoretical one micron that it could be and what we're saying is yeah 65 microns is pretty pretty damn good but what it does mean to say is we're accepting a lot of spherical aberration now this will be important later on now the other thing that's clearly stated here is that this also causes the best focus to occur at a different location than the theoretical focal point notice I'm being cynical about the word theoretical I personally think that the phrase best focus is a little bit confusing in its own right focus implies a single point and as you can clearly see there is no single point what we have really is an integration of the intensities of all the rays which come together at a single point where we get maximum light intensity so let's come back to our seven millimeter diameter beam and we know that it's roughly seven millimeters diameter because when we measured it at the beginning of this video we clearly saw that we had power at roughly plus or minus two millimeters from center and where's plus or minus two millimeters from center it's that point where we've got maximum intensity we've got very little power beyond plus or minus two millimeters if you look at this graph here so instead of using the absolute spot size as defined by JPT for this particular machine I'm going to use a close equivalent which is 0.07 70 microns as opposed to 65 microns and the reason for that is because it's a very nice factor of seven millimeters so what I've done I've taken the light intensity from a seven millimeter diameter beam and I've squashed it down to 0 0.07 as shown by the little picture on the right hand side there which means I have now increased the intensity by a factor of 7 divided by 0 0.07 which is a hundred times what occurs at the focal point is still a Gaussian distribution when we amplify the power we take every single part of that graph that you can see here and we multiply its amplitude by a hundred if we look just here <laughs> there's the little Gaussian distribution that we had to start with but it isn't like that now by the time we multiply every one of those amplitudes by a hundred so we've got a huge spike of energy at the center of this beam now now I don't want to run away with the idea that this is a drill or anything like that this is a graph 
of the intensity of light. But obviously, because we've got so much light intensity here at the center of the beam, it's going to have an influence way beyond the focal point itself. Because this beam is symmetrical on its way to the focal point and away from the focal point, it clearly implies that we're going to get exactly the same spike of energy above the focal point as well as below the focal point. So we're going to get this strange central core of energy around the focal point above and below it but extends both up and down from the focal point. If we take a look here at what JPT tell us about the lens itself, they tell us that there's a focal length 254 millimeters, which is what I've got on this machine. They also tell me that it's roughly, what, 63.9, 64 microns for the spot size across here. Okay. They then go on to tell me that we've got something called a depth of field or depth of focus, which extends in this particular instance to two millimeters, i.e. one millimeter above and one millimeter below the nominal focal point. We've got a useful working power. From other work that I've done, this depth of field stops at a point where approximately the area of the beam is twice the area of the waste. So if we've got a certain energy density at this point here, it will be half the energy density there. And that approximately defines the working depth of field for a lens. So at that point, the beam starts to go out of focus. This is a difficult concept for people to actually grab hold of. I've tried to explain it many, many times in my work. And this is where theory and practice tend to diverge. This is the practice that I've come across, and I know that I can produce a lot of damage way beyond the focal point. This is the method by which Lotus Laser focused the machine. We fiddle with the lens and we adjust the height up and down above and below the focal point. This is above the focal point and this is below the focal point until we get symmetry. Now, if we were getting symmetry because the beam was going out of focus, it would start going out of focus, according to JPT, at plus or minus one millimetre. We should find that we've got a 65 micron line just there in the centre. By the time we get out to plus or minus one millimetre, we should see that line growing to 90 microns. Does that look like a 90 micron line? No, it looks exactly the same as that 60 micron line. What about at two millimetres? No, that hasn't grown either. And at three millimetres? No. So wherever we go along this graph, we've got the same thickness of line. So we cannot be going out of focus with this line. What we're running out of is damage power. Here. Now the top picture was done when the power was set to 100%. Now let's just backtrack for a second. And how do we get to that picture there? Well, we got to that picture by multiplying this graph by 100. If we take this graph and reduce the power to 50%, it's going to get shorter and smoother. It's going to get blunter. OK. Its amplitude is going to get less because we're now going to multiply this graph by 100 because we've still got the same lens which multiplies by 100, but we're multiplying a smaller graph by 100. So we no longer have this very sharp, pointed 100% power. We shall have something that's roughly half the length, and it will have less of a point on it. It, it will still be sharpish, but it will be blunter. It will be softer, gentler at its maximum intensity point. So now we can begin to maybe understand why this picture at the top here is actually different than the picture at the bottom. This is 50% power. The influence beyond this so-called focal point here, which we've defined, has grown. We've got a much longer length of influence of that intensity. 
So it's no longer able to just do damage at plus or minus three millimeters. It's now able to do damage at plus or minus six millimeters. So we will just refer back again that we should theoretically, I'm being cynical again, be getting a 90 micron thickness at these plus and minus one millimeter points. Who knows what we should be getting at three or four, five and six millimeters. You know, there is no thickening of these lines. We're not picking up the out of focus part of the beam. What we're picking up here is the central core of energy in the beam. This core of light intensity. And that's the difference between the theoretical focus point and what I'm describing to you as the practice that actually happens within a lens. It doesn't just stop and go out of focus. Now this takes me back to the point where Lotus Laser asked me to make sure that if I tell you guys to use the focus as one of the parameters for limiting the power, that you do it by moving the work towards the lens and not away from the lens. I can accept what they say, but I need to understand what they're saying and why. The first thing that I can see here is that when they set the machine up, they're automatically going at least three millimeters below the focal point to set up zero. Now the zero that they've actually found is this point here, point at which you get maximum energy density. Now remember this energy density graph is not only below the focal point, it's also above the focal point. So if I find the matching extremities above and below the focal point, which is what I've done here, and we could call that the focal point. But I do know that this zero here is not that zero there. And now we're going to go on and try and explain why. And to do that, we need to look at this thing that I called earlier fuzzy focus. We absolutely know that this lens has got aberration. I've drawn this picture here on my CAD. And it, it's designed to be a graphical representation of what's happening in the beam. Light rays travel in straight lines. They cannot bend round corners unless they're affected by gravity or some other major effect as Einstein proved. But what it does show me is that out of 254 millimeters long, the red rays, the outer rays, which have got insignificant amount of energy in them, focus at roughly two, three, four, five millimeters. I don't know exactly what the number is, but I can be sure that it is some number of millimeters before and above the focal point. This is the extremity of the blue section now, which contains another 20% roughly of the energy that focuses maybe three, four, five, again, millimeters beyond the focal point. And wherever that focuses, the central core focuses another four, five, six millimeters beyond the blue zone. So when we zoom in and look at actually what's happening at the focal point, this nominal focal point just here, where my 70 micron spot is, we can see that the blue zone is crossing here and the yellow zone is crossing substantially further forward. But bear in mind that this yellow zone I've drawn is not at the center axis of the lens. These are the extremities of the yellow zone. As I get closer and closer to the center of axis of the lens, this crossing point, this focal point of that yellow zone is going to go out here to some stupid extreme. I mean, it's just a fact of geometry. If you make two lines parallel, they will never cross. But it is that intense part of the beam which is focused beyond the focal point. I cannot tell you how much. All I can demonstrate to you is the principle and the, not the theory, the practice that they will absolutely focus beyond this nominal focal point. That then asks the question, 
where is this integration of power? We've got the red beam there, which is carrying nothing but a hint of something. We've got the blue beam, which is moderately powerful. And we've got the yellow beam, which is carrying 70% of the energy of this beam. By inference, the yellow beam is going to win. There's going to be an addition and an integration of the blue beam as well. But what we're really saying is, look, just take a look at my little top picture there where it says 3.61 and 4.6. OK, that means the yellow beam is roughly a millimetre beyond the blue beam, which is not really true because that yellow beam is likely to be metres effectively beyond the yellow beam beyond the blue beam once it gets to its extremity. Let's just guess and say that the integration point where we get maximum intensity of all these beams combining is five millimeters below the focal point. So this is where the confusion comes in. We're happy to agree that at this point here we've got the integration of all the beams giving us the most intense point. That's not necessarily the focal point that's just the point of maximum energy density. But where is that point of maximum energy density in relation to the nominal focal point? The answer is probably four, five, six millimeters below the nominal focal point. I don't know. I can only show you in principle that it is not at the focal point. OK, now let's just leave the uncertainty of the focal point itself for a moment and we'll push on with something more important which is the material that we go to fire the laser beam at. Now we've got these three simple diagrams here. The most important thing in the first diagram is that dotted line which is something called the normal. That's the point of perfect perpendicularity to the surface and when you fire a beam at the surface it will always reflect relative to that normal. If the reflected ray is exactly the same as the incident ray, then we have a lovely mirror reflection. Now the next two pictures show the types of surface that we're going to be firing the laser beam at. The first one is called a specular surface, where the reflection bounces off exactly as a mirror reflection. It obeys that very simple rule. All the rays are bouncing off in a parallel direction and if you were looking at yourself in the mirror, you would see the handsome person that you are. Now, if you go to the next picture along, which is a diffusive reflection, where the surface now diffuses the light rays into random paths, it obeys all the same rules as the first image, mirror reflection. But at the point where the ray hits, we take the normal to the surface at that point and calculate the new angle of reflection. And as you can see, because the surface is irregular, the normals will not be parallel to each other. Therefore, the reflected rays will not be parallel to each other. And uh, this is a bit like looking at yourself in a distorted mirror, if you can see anything at all. Now, the other thing that's important about reflection is all to do with the wavelength of light. The sort of materials that we're worried about are metals. And all metals have got a very dense crystalline structure where the atomic particles are very closely bound together. If we have a short enough wavelength, then that wavelength is able to penetrate into the gaps between the atoms. And all of a sudden, the light becomes absorbed. But if the atomic distance is smaller than the wavelength of light that you fire at it, then we will get a specular reflection. We will get no penetration of the light into the surface of the material. Now, we can begin to see that phenomenon in this little diagram here. This is the wavelength of some um, typical materials that you will be using with this machine. The blue one is aluminium, then we've got gold, which is red, and silver, which is the black one. Now, if we take a look at the wavelength scale along the bottom, we're working with roughly one micron. Now, as you can see, above one micron, we've got something like, I don't know, 
1% or more reflectivity. At 1 micron, things are starting to change very slightly. If we drop down to 500 and maybe 400 nanometers, you can see the serious drop-off in the reflectivity of gold and silver. That's because the atomic spacing is such that at those points there, the waves are actually penetrating into the material and being absorbed. They're no longer being reflected. Now our concern in this video is all about reflectance off of the surface of materials. Now the only materials that are really going to be at risk for us are these sorts of materials here in this table. And you can see that at 10 microns, where we may be used to working with the CO2 laser, all of these materials are incredibly reflective. It does change for some of these materials as we get down to one micron. And that little table there shows you the risk associated with using these materials. OK, I think we've now collected all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that will enable us to probably go forward and try and decode the subject of this video, which is back reflectance. Now, we're going to use this diagram quite a few times in our discussion. Um, and it's important that you understand what it actually is. I know you can look at it and say, yeah, I can see that's a lens with some light rays going through it. Yes, but this is a simulation of an F-theta lens. This is not an F-theta lens. An F-theta lens is a very special three-dimensional version of a lens because it sweeps through a, um, a spherical orbit. And wherever it is in that orbit, it has to focus. That's a very complex thing to even try to draw, let alone to work with. So what we've got here is a simple plano convex lens, which exhibits all the same properties as this three dimensional F theta lens, but it's condensed back to two dimensions where it's much easier to comprehend what's going on. Now, this is not just some random drawing that I've created and out of my imagination. The lens itself is a creation, but it's a creation with a circular arc on the top of the lens. Now the circular arc represents a part of a sphere and normally a lens would have a spherical top surface. So this is a section, a centerline section through a lens. Because it is a geometric surface, a part of a spherical surface, it possesses something called spherical aberration. And as I've described before, spherical aberration is when rays from the outside focus at a different point to the rays passing closer to the axis of the lens. What I've done here, I've drawn the horizontal ray lines and I've used the same colours that I've used in the uh, Gaussian distribution curve so that you can keep that in mind that the yellow section down the middle contains about 70% of the energy or power of the beam. The next blue section there, we've got roughly 10% at either side and then we've got about 4% out from the blue to the red zone. So we've got this Gaussian distribution still implied in this beam. Once the beam hits the lens, I've then used the maths, the well-known maths of refraction, because I've assumed that the lens will be glass and that the beam is passing through air. So I've used the respective refractive indices for each of those materials, and I've constructed the correct geometric path of the ray as it passes into the glass and out of the glass back into air. So yeah, this is not a figment of my imagination. This is using lens theory, which as I said, I'm not deriding lens theory. What I'm saying to you is that lens theory does not go as far as lens practice. So here we can clearly see that lens theory will show us the way in which the focal points do not coincide. And this aberration is exactly what we get with the F theta lens. If we take a look at that top diagram, that's an enlarged view of the focal point in the diagram below it. Look carefully and you'll see that there's a little gray wasted section there, which I've mapped in to show you the, if you like, the way that the focus point is normally diagrammatically shown. This is not a diagrammatic showing of the waste. This is a, an actual showing of the various intersections of focal points from various parts of the lens. And you can see it's a bit of a mess. But the other thing that I'd like you to note is that beyond these various focal points, the rays are no longer nice and evenly spaced out. We've got a change of energy distribution 
below the focal point. We're now going to carry out some little tests to see what happens when we move the material above and below the nominal focal point. Now in this first test we're going to move above the focal point which is supposedly the safe zone. And here's what happens. We get a perfect mirror image of where the rays would be if they were allowed to proceed normally. All that happens is we get them reflected just in front of our mirror plane. Now this means that they're not going to get anywhere near the lens and so you must consider that moving above the focal point is definitely safe. Let's just see what happens when we project the rays and see where they go when they reach the lens. So the dotted lines here are showing the reflected rays. And we can see that as we project those rays out and hit the lens, I've again mathematically calculated the correct path of the ray through the lens and then out back into air again. And you can see that the path of those rays is always diverging. That's the important point. They are diverging beyond the lens, which means they are losing their power. They have no capability of refocusing anywhere in the optical path. So this is definitely safe to work above the focal point. Okay now let's carry out exactly the same exercise but this time you can see the green line where we were reflecting above the focal point. What I've done I've swapped it over and moved it to the other side of the focal point. And again we've got dotted rays there that reflect back off of a surface and if we look the red rays are just harmlessly disappearing out into nowhere. It depends on how far we move beyond the focal point as to where those red rays will go. But let's face it, those red rays have only got 4% of energy. So even if they get refocused back through the lens, they're not exactly going to cause a great deal of problem. The blue rays are slightly more interesting because at this coincidental distance, which I chose, they seem to be parallel with the previous red rays as they go back towards the optical system. Now that still means that they're not particularly dangerous, but I suspect that if I were to move that green plane in very slightly towards the focal point, then my blue rays would start to converge in the same way that if you follow the yellow rays back, they are definitely converging. Now, OK, it may well be a very slow convergence, but, but that means we're going to go a long way back into the optical system before we get convergence and reach a focal point. I don't think we need to go any further to establish that the information that I've been given is correct. I wouldn't necessarily say the explanations that I've been given have been very clear. So that's why I've had to do this investigation myself to try and understand exactly what's going on. Now I don't want to exaggerate the situation out of all proportion because it doesn't mean to say you can't focus below the focal point. Only if you've got reflective materials should you be careful. Not all materials that you're going to be using are reflective. For example you might be using black anodized aluminium or coloured anodized aluminium. That's not a reflective surface, that's an absorptive surface. So really it's a matter of using your common sense. The other th important thing to remember is that if a material has a flat surface, whether it's polished or not, and it's one of these reflective materials, it is a risk. So if you like to recall what I mentioned about reflectivity, it's all to do with the wavelength of the light and the atomic spacing of the material that you're firing the wavelength at. If that atomic spacing is less than the wavelength of the light, then there will be a reflection. Now I'm going to draw your attention to section C. Basically the advice that I've been given is that high power is high risk when you fire it at a reflective material. Okay, that makes perfect sense. But it leaves me with a little bit of a problem. We can melt material with this laser, even though it's only got 20 watts. But that's because it develops huge amounts of power in a very, very 
short period of time. We've got a two nanosecond pulse, but it probably takes less than a quarter of a nanosecond to rise from zero to 12 kilowatts. If we can sneak up on it quick enough, we may well melt it before it has a chance to realise that it's been hit. And if we melt the material and change it into a puddle, all of a sudden it absorbs all the energy rather than reflect it. But that then leaves one question which I'm afraid I cannot answer. Is there enough reflected energy in that very, very short period of time to go back through the optical system and damage it before the energy starts being 100% absorbed by the melt pool? But if we stay above the focal point, I don't think we even have to worry about the problem. Because if there is focus, as we've demonstrated, it will not get back into the optical system. However, if for any reason you do want to work below the focal point with a reflected material and put your machine at risk, then can I suggest the following precaution? This diagram here with the top set of rays shows what happens when the ray hits the surface of the table absolutely perpendicular. We have the risk of reflection back into the system. Now, if you move your work 12 and a half millimetres to one side, what will happen is you will get the second ray. But that means that any reflection off of your workpiece will now reflect to the third ray. And that third lower ray, as you can see, misses the lens. So provided you use a 25 millimetre diameter no-go zone in the centre of your table, you will stand no chance of reflecting any rays back up into your lens, even if you work below the focus point. Now, I did have one final thought. Maybe my exaggerated pictures were not necessarily telling me the truth. So, despite the fact that I'd done all the refraction calculations and drawings correctly, what I've done here now is to draw the complete system to scale. So we've got a seven millimeter beam here, which I'm only showing the blue and the yellow central power sections. So there are the beams passing through the 0 0.07 spot size. At the limits that I've chosen, they're roughly the same dimension, about four millimeters past the focal point. Now I do keep mentioning this, but that yellow beam there hasn't really got a focal point here, coincident with the blue. The blue is never going to get any closer to parallel because it is a limit. But those yellow lines, remember, are only the 70% power limit. Within that power limit, we've got all other power, which is going closer to the axis of the lens. And as we get closer to the axis of the lens, the lines are going to become closer to parallel and their intersection point is going to go way out into space over there somewhere. So you can see how impossible it would be to illustrate this on a piece of paper because I wouldn't be able to scale in and out. So in this second picture here, I've scaled it properly with all the correct refractive indices, dimensions and angles as I pass through the lens. But this time I've dropped the beam by 10 millimeters below the focal point where we're told if we come up through the center of the lens here, we shall get a converging beam. Now what we're seeing here off this 10 millimeter below the focal point plane is a reflection of the orange beam and the blue beam. Okay, now you're not seeing the original beam there, you're just seeing the reflected beams because I've, I've pasted them out so that they're not confusing. So it certainly looks as though if we go below center we will create a converging beam. So let's look what happens if we go above center. Here's what zero looks like, 254. And here's what 10 millimeter above center looks like. And if we put a reflection plane just here, what we're really going to do is to pick up this piece here and completely mirror it. Now it's very confusing to put this little mirrored piece in here. So I've left it out 
for the time being so you can see the reflected part of the beam but the whole point of it is look <laughs> this part of the beam is going to focus where it would focus if it went beyond the 10 millimeter plane so this beam is immediately going to go into focus just above the reflection plane so that looks as though it's completely safe but let's follow these beams back and again I have removed the incoming beam and we're only seeing the reflected beam as a dotted beam here and if we take a look at that dotted beam as it passes through the lens and then carries on 4.34 4.69 it's going into a diverging condition it appears to be relatively safe so whether I use my earlier exaggerated pictures or these real one-to-one -one scale pictures we still come up with the same confirming evidence lens theory says that yes the beam will hit the lens and it will then converge if you're below the focal point and it will diverge if you're above the focal point regardless of what the theory says there's only one way to really find out what's going on when light reflects back through this lens and that is to reflect light back through the lens so here we've got the machine lens here we've got a mirror and here we've got a red LED pointer it's a it's a laser diode now this red laser diode has got a focusing element on the front of it which allows me to set it up so that the beam is virtually parallel it can be set to a focus at a certain distance but I've tried to get it as far as possible a parallel beam now that dot looks pretty small on the mirror I would estimate that spot as being probably half to three quarters of a millimeter but as soon as I put something in front of it to look at it look that dot glows to something like about two millimeter diameter or the light wave that's going into the mirror is bouncing off the back face of the mirror and as it comes forward it's cancelling some of the light that's going in I don't know which effect is happening there but all I can say is the mirror has got a smaller dot than the paper the spot size looks bigger than the 0.065 that's claimed for it but hey, we're not going to be worried about that because that's not our argument in this case we're not testing the spot size we're testing what happens to that beam when it reflects back through the lens there's the beam that's going into the lens so if I had to put a circle around that dot I would say it's probably about four millimeters diameter which in essence is equivalent to the blue and the yellow zones on my Gaussian curve so we've got basically a simulation of the high powered path there so the way that I've got this set up at the moment is that returning spot is pretty close to the center line of the sending LED so you can see it just sitting there on the center of this window and it's just about to drop in the outgoing beam and incoming beam are now completely cancelling each other out and the interesting thing is to watch this um, corona so just as I get in and the beam is on the edge of itself we get that interference pattern I then carry on moving across the beam as I exit on the other side so it's not on the center so right on the center it looks as though we've got cancellation by the look of it because the halo disappears fascinating but does that help us what I'm more interested in is what's happening here to that dot now that's a pretty bright four millimeter dot at that point there that's with the focus set at 254 now if I move the focus forward i.e. I'm going to push the focal point up towards the lens does it have an effect the answer is not really it's not noticeable and I can't see really any change at all there for 10 millimeters the next thing is can we take it short by 10 millimeters and see an increase or a decrease in that dot now I'm looking at it well as I push the lens towards it 
it is actually decreasing. So I, can, I think we can imply that as we move the focal point below the lens, there is a focusing effect on the beam that returns to the optical system. And that is the bad news that really we're talking about. Okay, so now we're looking at the reflection in the mirror. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to move that dot that previously was reflecting straight back into the optical device. And I'm going to move it off to the side. And what you'll be able to see by looking in there is how much the dot moves. Now my reflection is not hitting the sensor. And now it is. If we have a dead zone in the centre of the work that's probably about six or seven millimetres diameter, we won't get any reflection back into the optical system. Well, let's just put this lens back where it belongs. Now, we started off this session basically by asking the question, why mustn't I touch that big red button that you tell me I mustn't touch? No real answer. Not that it was plausible anyway. So, the only way to find out is to take the plate off, follow the wiring back and find out what that big red button controls. Yes, I agree. I mustn't touch that big red button and that's basically what we've achieved today. Having been told that under certain circumstances the light will bounce back up through the lens and damage the optics. And we've basically proved that in three different ways. Number one, we've used a plano convex lens analogy in a slightly exaggerated form and that worked and said we shouldn't work below the focal point. We've used the scale drawings of this system and that indicated that we shouldn't work below the focal point. But then we've used the real F theta lens to verify what's actually happening when we bounce off a shiny surface. And it again proves the point that yes, we should have to be careful when we work below the focal point. But if you do work below the focal point, all you've got to do is make sure you steer clear of something like a maybe a six or seven millimetre diameter no-go zone right in the middle of your table here. And then you will have no chance of light going back up through the optical system. Now I've seen all sorts of fantastical images of where these light rays go when they bounce off the surface. Somewhere out here, round Venus, coming back and disappearing up my bottom. OK, so I've got a tendency to exaggerate, but they're just as wild and unbelievable as that. Plus the fact that I'm told that you can seriously damage the lens and the mirrors up here in the Galvo. Any beam that goes back is on a diverging path, so it's going to be no more powerful coming through the lens this way than it is going back through the lens that way. I don't think the lens or the Galvo mirrors are ever at risk. That's a personal opinion based on what I've experienced today. But I can perceive that there is risk to the actual fibre optic interface. So the summary really is, if you stay above the focal point for your defocusing, you will never have a problem. So really the no-no is, don't focus below the focal point. But in the next session I'm going to do something interesting where, as you might imagine, you've guessed it. I'll see you then. Bye for now and thanks for your time.